And from Lakes Region Volkswagen Audi, serving New Hampshire with professional sales and service. On the web at 1-800-9VWAudi.com. This is Word of Mouth on New Hampshire Public Radio on Virginia Prescott. Coming up today, we'll peek in on a Granite State celebration of Yoga Day USA to find out why hardy Yankees are taking up the 5,000-year-old practice of yoga. We'll also get some highlights of conversations and issues percolating in the global blogosphere and talk to a musician who's creating a soundtrack for happiness. But we begin with an installment of our next Green Thing series. Today, an exploration of technological fixes for warming global climate. Global temperatures are on the rise and weather patterns changing more quickly than many leading climatologists had anticipated. The international community can't agree on how to legislate carbon and has so far failed to curb emissions. A few years ago, the concept of geoengineering, or deliberately manipulating the climate to counter the effects of climate change, received little traction in the scientific community. It was too risky, politically unacceptable, even downright loopy. Today, a growing number of scientists are calling for a plan B, not as an alternative to curbing our emissions, but as a safety net for disaster. Katrine Brahick is an environmental reporter for The New Scientist, where she's been covering geoengineering schemes and she's on the line from London. Katrine, thanks so much for joining us. Hi there. Well, what exactly is geoengineering? Uh, well, as you explained, it's basically the idea of um, finding some sort of technological fix to the problem of climate change. So um, generally what we're trying to do is limit emissions and reduce the amount of CO2 that we pump into the atmosphere. But if that can't be achieved, then there are scientists out there who think that we should be looking at how to counter the warming that is being enhanced by this climate change. And some of those are quite radical, but some are quite doable. Let's go through some of the projects that fall under this umbrella, you know, maybe some of the most doable to the most far out. Um, uh, well, uh, from the most doable, the things that are being considered at the moment, there's things like fertilizing the ocean with uh, very small particles of iron. So the idea is that plankton, the, the small suspended plants that live in the ocean, need iron to grow. And if you give them more iron, then you get more plankton. And since they're plants, they use CO2, so they absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and, and suck it into the oceans. Now, some of those plants it's thought, then die and drop to the bottom of the ocean and, and would drag the carbon with them. There's experiments being done at the moment. In fact, there's a, a ship out in the Southern Ocean right now um, to see whether or not this would actually work. Um, when we say doable, it's all very much up for question at the moment. There's, hmm. there's, no, there's no sense of how practical these things are. It's all very much on the sort of drawing board. Yeah, some um, of them are pretty uh, big ideas, you know, inserting giant mirrors in space, for example. Yeah, that, that I'd say is definitely on the far out there scale of things. <laughs> um, it has been suggested. I don't think it's anything that um, that is being taken very seriously at the moment. I could be wrong. There could be some people out there who are looking at it much more seriously than I think. Well, how do they look at these uh, scientists that are proposing these? I'm imagining, you know, they're doing computer modeling, trying to figure out how they work out, but how do they get a sense of what happens in the long term? Could there be some environmental damage over long term usage? Well, that's, that's precisely the type of concerns that are being raised, and that's exactly why a number of scientists are now saying that we need to experiment with these things and, and see what would happen. So try them on a small scale before they're deployed on a large scale. Um, I think for a lot of them, in order for them to be effective, you'd have to have pretty much a global deployment. And obviously, something like that is not something you want to do um, on that scale as an experiment first off. Now, these geoengineering proposals also raise big questions of who's in charge of regulating, for one. I mean, would it be the UN, individual governments? That's a very good question, and I don't think it's something that is actually... 
<laughs> yeah, there are a lot of questions. I mean, the point is that these, as you mentioned in your introduction, these are things that were considered slightly crackpot um, a few years ago and are now starting to be considered slightly more seriously. So it's not, we definitely don't have many answers about them at the moment. Uh, I think the issue of regulation is a very serious one. It's It's something that would need to be considered probably at the UN level, but given you know, given the pace at which negotiations advance within the UN, it's difficult to see how that would all happen. But um, but it's definitely, it, it's not something that, that, that should be taken lightly given the scale of the operations. Well, critics of geoengineering worry about the perception of the quick fix for climate change, you know, that it will undermine efforts to reduce mm-hmm. carbon emissions. How strong is that opposition? Um, the critics tend to be very... Uh, spoken. Um, how strong? I mean, I think it's a fair point. I think there's definitely, and this is just my personal opinion. I think we don't want to detract from efforts to reduce the amount of emissions that uh, that we produce. There's um, there's no question that these schemes couldn't really work on their own. They're not silver bullets. They're not things that would just magically from one day to the next cool the planet. Um, so in any case, it's not a quick fix. Um, There's also, you know, depending on the scheme that you're looking at, they would act more or less rapidly. They would come into effect more or less rapidly. You might be looking at a cooling at the end of the century, not not in 10 years' time. Mm. So I I don't think anybody who's very serious out there is suggesting that we should give up on every other plan to deal with climate change and just decide to put mirrors up in space. In addition, uh, you mentioned the ocean fertilization. There are also talk mm-hmm. of sunshades injecting air with uh, artificial sulfur particles mm-hmm. that would mimic uh, sulfates from a vo- volcanic explosion. Cool roofs, that's something that's being used now. Cloud seeding. So some of them aren't so radical. But, you know, given this, Katrine, what's your prediction? I mean, this stuff does not work quickly. Is this all academic, this conversation, or will we be hearing more about geoengineering in the coming months, do you reckon? I think we'll be hearing much more about it. Um, I think it was academic uh, three years ago, and I think more and more the people I speak to tend to be people who are, who've got you know very reputable climate scientists who are who are starting to say, well, if you know the, the question isn't going to go away, people are going to keep up keep coming up with these um, ideas, and so we need to do it carefully. We need to look into it carefully. Well, Katrine, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Katrine Brahick is an environmental reporter for The New Scientist. Now, we do have a link to that article with some of the innovations that she was talking about at wordofmouthradio.org. Up next on Word of Mouth, beware, beware the deranged... population and our use of the finite resources of planet Earth are growing exponentially, along with our technical ability to change the environment for good or ill. But our genetic code still carries the selfish and aggressive instincts that were of survival advantage in the past. It will be difficult enough to avoid disaster in the next hundred years, let alone the next thousand or million.